let me ask you about Israel. Um, sort of just the first personal question. I, I, I know you've been a critic for Israel for a while before October 7th, but with October 7th, I think a lot of things changed. For one thing, it was the first time in years that Israel was really on the front burner of our politics. So people didn't really care if you were an Israel critic because it wasn't really being discussed. The second thing is I think October 7th really radicalized a lot of people. I have a ton of friends in my life who are Jewish who never much cared about Israel. They were kind of apathetic, maybe even a little critical. And it shocked me, actually, and not just in the days, but weeks and months after October 7th, they became vehement Israel supporters to the point where they were telling me they couldn't even watch my show. And obviously, there are a lot of people who have such strong emotional sentiments about Israel who don't want to hear any Israel criticism. We've lost, I don't know, 10 to 15 percent of our show, of our audience at the beginning. You know, it's built back up. But, you know, that's not, it, it's something we anticipated, but it did happen. Um, and I know that, you know, the very big following that you build up is not really a big left wing following. You probably have some left leftists in your following, but I know a lot of them are anything but leftists. And I've seen a lot of them kind of angry at you for the stance you've taken very vocally and continuously in your criticism of Israel. Why was that a stance that you felt was so necessary for you not just to express, but to kind of continuously advocate knowing the difficulties it would cause for you? Well, that, okay, so that is true. I've had a lot of people who were very upset uh, about this. Um, I, I don't know, man, I, I made a decision a long time ago uh, that I'm just going to tell the truth and let the chips fall where they may. And, you know, when I say the truth, the truth is I see it and I might be wrong. And I'm sure I am wrong about some things, but very few. And I, uh, I, I just that was th there was I mean, there was a period of time. I remember when I first started getting invited onto Fox News shows, um, which is like the first time I ever got on television it was like in 2015 or something like that. So like around 10 years ago. And I remember Look, I was never told this exactly, but I, they, they when I first came on, I had some good appearances on a few different shows, and there were some like producers at Fox News who were like, "Hey, there's like people upstairs who are talking about you. They want to have a meeting with you. They would like if you weren't too crazy, you know." And like, I just kind of knew without anyone ever telling me this that like if I could just kind of compromise some of my more anti-war views or some of this, that I could maybe get like a cushy job here. And that when I was dead broke, that was like really tempting. Um, and in that moment, I just decided I was like, listen, my heroes, my heroes are like Ron Paul and people like that. And what I love about them is that they said the thing that would get them booed out of the, the arena that they were in, including on Israel, care. including on Israel. Yes. Ron Paul was a very yes. outspoken critical of Israel and the U.S. relationship to it. And, and as a as a Texas Republican, you know, and so I, I just made a decision back then when I was dead broke, I made a decision that I would have integrity and just tell the truth. So now, like, I'm doing pretty well. I mean, not as good as some people, but I'm doing I'm making way more than I should. And so at this point, it's like, oh, no, I don't know. That's just what I'm going to do. And I should. I think that. I'm supposed to piss my audience off sometimes. Like I remember um, I was in the summer of 2020. So I, I had been I, I had been very against the lockdowns and all of the COVID insanity. And then I, I was really critical of Black Lives Matter during the summer of, of 2020 and particularly of like the rioting and just how insane that was. And that after the country had been through like the most devastating three or four months in modern American history, that you had these bands of, of people going around and like destroying small businesses who were like desperate to keep their doors open. And I was just so disgusted by like the looting and the rioting and stuff like that. And then uh, months later, when that guy Chauvin uh, got convicted for for murder in the first degree. And I was like, I, I, I remember tweeting about it and being like, good for him. He deserves to go to jail. But like, you know, I think that was the right decision. And my audience was like, oh, Dave, what you're siding with CNN now? I thought you were a critic of Black Lives Matter and all of this. And I was like, yeah, but I'm what? <laughs> like, just because I hate people rioting and looting doesn't mean I think a cop who had 
like a handcuffed guy on the ground who was in the middle of a panic attack and just knee laid his knee on his neck for 10 minutes. Isn't like, you know what I mean? So like, I, I Okay, fine. So you could, my audience could be upset with me a little bit. I think my, the bond I have with my audience is that I always say, I'm going to tell you the truth as I see it. So, okay, I'm going to do that in every situation. And I, I just think that, you know, to your point where there were a lot of people who maybe weren't like super aware or super involved of what was going on in Israel, I do kind of understand that if you just looked at October 7th, you'd be like, yo, this is like the most brutal thing I've ever seen. And so, of course, we should be against that. But I've just been paying attention a while longer than that. And I also know how brutal Israel's occupation of Palestine has been. And that just gives you a totally different perspective on it. And I'm aware, I've read a ton about this. I just, I know a lot about the history. I'm not saying like I'm, I'm an expert or anything. There's people who know more than me, but I know... I know a decent amount and I know enough to understand that it look the thing that the, the moment that uh, sparked my interest on libertarianism and what led me down this whole rabbit hole was the Ron Paul Giuliani moment. And um, I know you've played this clip on your show not uh, fairly recently, but I know you've seen it way before then um, where Ron Paul is just making the argument that he's like, look, they don't, the terrorists don't hate us because we're rich and, and we're free. They hate us because we're over there killing so many innocent people and propping up dictators and supporting Israel and their in their ethnic cleansing and domination of the Palestinians and all of this. And and I thought that was like the most fascinating point ever. And then I got obsessed with reading about it. And in a in a very similar sense, I've just always been able to understand that while there are these voices that will say, well, you know, the real problem is that they hate us because of our freedom. Or the real problem is that that Islam is so evil and and you know, whatever. Or these people are just so sick or they're just so anti-Semitic. But if you actually look into like what's actually happening in any of these situations, one of the, I mean, it's very dark, but in, in a dark sense, one of the things that kind of unites all of us is that you actually realize how much these things unite us. I mean, like we're all kind of the same when it comes to this. Like after 9-11, we got hit and some innocent people got killed. And we went, you know what? You hit us. We're going to go get you. Like, if you do that to us, we're going to, you, oh, you think you could just kill us? We're going to go kill a whole bunch of you. And then you kind of realize it's like, yeah, that's exactly how those people who flew the buildings into the towers felt. Exactly the same way you feel right now. And I just think that as, as horrific and evil as Hamas is and how inexcusable what they did on October 7th was, I think that. Almost any group of people, if put under the, the conditions that the Palestinians have been put under, would end up in a very similar place. And, you know, I got, I got, I know you have kids, Glenn. I have, I have kids. And, you know, I was just talking about this on Candace Owens' show the other day when I did one of these debates. It's like, I, it's not that hard for me to go like, what, how would I feel if someone did something like to one of my kids? Then I just, I immediately just see red. I'd immediately just go like, I, I'd probably join up with the worst, most barbaric group around who felt like we could get some revenge against those people. And I think that's what's going on with the Israelis and with the people in Gaza right now. Like, I, I think it's actually what kind of, in a weird way, unites us. It's, it's a human characteristic that we all have. And I just don't, I, I, think, I think I'm right about this. And I think I understand it. And I'm just not going to stop talking about that because, you know, like I, I have I have a little boy and a little girl. And particularly because I have a little boy, maybe this is the sexism in me or something like that. But I just go like, what type of example would I be for him if I I believed something passionately, but because there's some social pressure to not say it, I'll not say it. Like, no, I have to be a better example than that. And the example I want to be for my son and my daughter, too is uh is that no you tell the truth even when it might cost you something yeah you know the amazing thing about it is you know as you said you can understand these tribal rages if even if there's reason for it if your tribe is attacked 
and you see suffering in your tribe and all around you, of course you're going to feel rage to the outsiders who did it instead of thinking rationally about what you might have done to provoke it or what the... The problem is that we're supposed to have this kind of global order. That's what the UN was about and other things, just responsible leaders who then come in and try and negotiate ways to avoid that tribal rage from exploding into something completely horrific. And in the case of the United States, and therefore NATO and others who might have been able to do that, we've done the exact opposite and instead cheered Israel on and fed them the weapons and paid for the money that they need in order to destroy Gaza. Um, all right, just a few more questions, a couple more questions, actually. And this might be a personal one. Um, but how many security officers and armed guards have you had to hire since October 7th to walk outside your house given this epidemic of anti-Semitism <laughs> that has made it unsafe for Jewish people to walk on the streets? Have you been okay? Oh Are you okay? God. You know, I've managed, I've managed to, uh, to not hire any so far. And um, I'm sure this is only because, you know, I, honestly, I feel more, uh, I, I'm more concerned about uh, the, the, pro-Israeli protesters uh, or something like that. But I listen, I just hate um, and I, I don't particularly like whining from any minority group. I mean, there the, look, there are there are situations where it's totally appropriate if you're being victimized to complain about being victimized. But I have always hated just, at, at, you know, as someone who's Jewish and this is what I grew up in way before October 7th. I've always just hated um, passionately the kind of like victim complex in the Jewish community. I do understand it to some degree. I think better than most. I understand, you know, my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. My mother's the first generation after that. Um, and I, I think from in, in my parents' generation and certainly in my grandparents' generation of Jewish people, there was always this kind of like, they came to get us once, this could happen again any moment, we're up against it. It was essentially all of Europe who condoned this and that Jews always have to be concerned about this. I, I've always just rejected that as divorced from reality. And I think that my attitude has always been like, look, my, my grandfather grew up in Nazi Germany. He had everything taken from him, including all of his family members, including his father's business, his school, like everything. He, he barely escaped on a boat he wasn't supposed to be on and, and got out so he could come here and start a new life. And here in this country, he was able to come with nothing, literally nothing except the clothes on his back and come here and start a great life. And, and a couple generations later, I have never once in my life had a single obstacle put in my way because I'm Jewish, not one. I, I may have had a few because I'm white, you know, or considered that, but like there's definitely been some things in my life where like if you were like a, a minority, a different minority, it may have been helpful to get this position. But even that I don't care about. But there's never been one opportunity denied to me because I was Jewish and someone in a, in a powerful position went, we're not giving this opportunity to a Jew. This just never happened. And I like, what am I supposed to do? Pretend that's happened? The truth is that Jewish people are around 2% of of the United States of America, they are exceptionally successful. I, I do not, um, I do not at all uh, think there's anything wrong with that. Like as I was saying to you before, I'm a libertarian. I don't, I don't think there's a problem in inequality, and I don't think there's a problem in one group being um, very successful as long as they're doing that through legitimate means and not, you know, like coercive means. But I just hate, I hate the kind of victim uh ideology and you know since october 7th i'm not saying there's been uh, there there have been there there's some people who kind of like hate jews i see the comments on twitter and stuff like that there's been some chance at some of these protests that i'm like i'm a little uncomfortable with that chant and i wish they would say something different but i just think like to pretend that the objection to what israel's been doing over the last 8 months 
must all be reduced down to people just secretly hate Jews, I think is ridiculous. And particularly when the protests are being led by so many left wingers in America, where look to all of these people, the worst thing in the world you could be, what's the worst name they could call you, Glenn? What's the name they call Donald Trump or they call all the people they hate? Nazi. Nazi is the worst thing you can be called. I just don't believe that these people are animated by a hatred of Jews. I think what they're animated by, and perhaps they're they're somewhat animated by a hatred of the more Western civilization attacking a more, you know what I mean? Like, a, like there, there might be some of that. There's some oppressor versus oppressed kind of narrative in there. But I think mostly it's just that they're seeing images of babies being pulled out of rubble every day day after day who wouldn't be day after who, day yeah who wouldn't who wouldn't be ready to protest that that like i mean just like look for the simplest explanation and that seems to be it and and uh, and i wish i'm sure you do too i i was heartbroken over the evaporation of the anti-war left during barack obama and i was heartbroken that it didn't return under donald trump and I, you know, I wish the left wing kids had been out, you know, protesting the the war in Libya and Syria and Somalia and Yemen and the drone bombing campaign in Pakistan and, you know, Obama's surge in Afghanistan. I wish all of that stuff had drawn the level of outrage that George W. Bush's war in, in Iraq and Afghanistan drew. And, and so, yeah, they're they're kind of back now. Which is a little bit of an awkward feeling because you're kind of like, yeah, where, where are you guys been? I've been waiting for you guys. But at the same time, to say the reason they're back is just because they hate Jewish people so much, that just, there's no evidence for that. It just doesn't seem right at all. It seems more like this is just the most blatant example of something that is so horrifically wrong. And even they can see that. We well, you know I have to say on this, I mean, this has been something that I have probably focused on almost more than anything else since October 7th, it has been driving me genuinely mad in both senses of, of the word mad. Um, because I have a very similar trajectory to you. I had a grandmother who fled uh, Nazi Germany in the late 1930s with her uh, younger sister. And both of them came to the United States and the rest of their family stayed and they were all killed in, in concentration camps. I was steeped with the idea that Jews have been persecuted throughout history, which is true, including with the Holocaust. But, you know, I have to say, the thing, and there's a lot of things that have been raging me about the hypocrisy of sort of the pro-Israel right and this kind of, you know, anti-woke crowd about when it comes to free speech, they seem to not care about it that much anymore. They find reasons to celebrate censorship. They use this kind of safety narrative for colleges, et cetera, et cetera, all the things they've been heaping scorn on. But the thing that has made me the angriest about it is, you know, I've lived in the United States for 38 years. I lived in the, from the first 38 years of my life as a Jew. Every member of my family is a Jew. Almost every friend with whom I grew up is a Jew. And not only can I say that in those 38 years, I have never once experienced an anti-Semitic attack or assault or feeling like I was discriminated against or even an anti-Semitic comment. I don't know a single Jew that I know who are all around the United States who can say that they have either. And that isn't to say, as you said, that there's not some anti-Semitism. Of course there is, and there always has been. But there's also a lot of anti-black racism. That really is true. There's anti-Muslim racism. There's anti-immigrant hatred. There is hatred against trans people of the type that can be dangerous. And every single time those narratives were raised by other groups, the consensus reaction of the American right and the pro-Israel right and the kind of anti-woke crowd that you know branded itself so lucratively was, oh, this is just whiny victimhood. This is just people trying to claim that you know everyone is against them and everyone hates him. And now to watch those same people do exactly the same thing on behalf of a group that, as you say, is doing very, very, very well in the United States and always has been, and there's no evidence that they're unsafe in any way, has really uh, kind of sickened me. All right, let, let me ask you just as a final well, question. Can I just, go ahead. Can yeah, I just go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Go ahead. What, what's so crazy about it, right, is that at least for, for say, like, black Americans, like, there is a real issue. Now, you, we could debate forever what exactly is causing this and what exactly is the solution to this. But like 
everybody in say I'm, I'm sure you've before in your life you've taken the um the amtrak from new york to dc i could just tell you every powerful person on media or in the political class has taken that amtrak ride before from new york to dc if you go sit in the first class of excella you're gonna see like powerful people on that train ride and go look out your window when you pass the baltimore station just look out your window it is a nightmare that you look out at like every other building is condemned there's little kids out with no shoes on there it's just like a level of power it, it's like a third world culture a third world country right before you get to the capital and it is overwhelmingly black people who are living there so I'm not saying it's as simple as like you could blame that on systemic racism or just some term that isn't is like ill defined, but there at least is a problem. You'd go like, hey, what's going on here? Like, what's leading to this? With Jews, there's just no such thing as that. It just doesn't matter. And then to see, like, I was just watching the other day at that monk debate. Uh, Douglas Murray opening up with his whole lecture about how anti-Semitism is a shape-shifting virus. And anyone who's criticizing Israel today, this is just a different version of supporting pogroms or supporting the Holocaust. And you're like, dude, this is, this is so much weaker than the dumbest woke argument about how basically, you know, like this is slavery and Jim Crow is the same thing as we have today. It's it's the same argument, except much weaker. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, all you've heard from the right over the last 10 years is you call everybody racist. As soon as you disagree with them, what happens in a Israel debate? They immediately call you an anti-Semite. The idea that you scoff at claims of discrimination from groups that are obviously doing far less than Jews, as you said, like black people, like immigrants who are illegal immigrants, like Muslims, a whole range of people. And the right's reaction has been, oh, stop whining, stop complaining. You just and then sure. the minute, you know, some Jewish student feels uncomfortable at Harvard, they literally convene congressional hearings after mocking this whole safety as a narrative to say, oh, here are a bunch of Harvard students who don't feel safe because people are chanting pro-Palestinian quotes. I mean, the hypocrisy of it really, it has been it has been sickening to to observe. <laughs> Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.